Hello, BISC 130. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 3-5. So in the previous recorded lecture, we briefly got started on this chapter just to introduce or reintroduce some important terms and concepts regarding just DNA and nucleotide structure. Uh, now, with that background, with that terminology, we're going to talk about DNA replication. So not for the not for the last time not for the first time uh once again we are gonna have to compare prokaryotes and eukaryotes um lucky for us the way they replicate their dna uh is is pretty similar so uh, technically this section is called dna replication in prokaryotes but everything that i'm about to say i'm heading just underneath you know calling it just dna replication it's true for all of these cells when i finish describing the basic process of dna replication then we will talk about how it is different from prokaryotes versus eukaryotes but on the whole it is the same so dna replication making more dna this is going to be part of binary fission this is going to be part of the eukaryotic cell cycle cells need to be able to to double up their dna to copy over their dna to replicate their dna all of this all of this is going to take place at a location in the cell called the replication fork and Oh boy, it looks like there's a lot going on here. Um, uh, by the end of this lecture, um, we will hopefully understand everything that's going on here. I'll, I'll go through this entire thing one little piece at a time. Uh, it's not as intimidating as it maybe seems. Uh, what I'm introducing now is just the idea of replication fork being the phrase to describe this location and yeah it kind of looks like a fork in the road here as you go from two strands down to one strand yeah replication fork is just where this is happening so dna replication takes place at the replication fork now like i said there, there's a lot going on here we could break this down one step at a time so i'm gonna number these just so we could count through this talking about the first enzyme involved in this process an enzyme called dna helicase so we can see dna helicase sometimes just called helicase we could see it labeled here uh, but again this figure is very busy looking so here's another one that's much more simplified showing just helicase now all all these figures are going to depict the many enzymes involved in dna replication as you know triangles or circles or rectangles or little blobs I, I really just want you to to have in your head that any enzyme we talk about is going to have some big complicated three-dimensional structure these are these are proteins with tertiary structure these things uh th these these things are more complicated than just a triangle or a blob or whatever they will be drawn as a triangle or a blob or whatever but yeah the complicated proteins anyway so what is the job of helicase well if we are going to replicate dna what we're going to do is we're going to take a single strand of dna and knowing the rules of base complementarity we're going to build another strand complementary to this one if there's a if there's an a here we're going to build a, a t if there's a g here we're going to put in a c and so on so if we're going to build a fresh strand of dna complementary to another strand we have to make it single stranded you can't go through that exercise with double stranded dna so it makes sense that the first step here is to make single stranded dna so helicase unwinds the dna helix again going to be a lot of enzymes here most of their names make a lot of sense so dna helicase unwinds the dna double helix and of course it breaks hydrogen bonds between the bases that's what's holding together this double helix so it has to break apart those bonds in order to make them single stranded and yes in doing so it creates two importantly two single stranded templates of dna we are actually going to replicate both of these so that's what we've got so far dna helicase unwinding the dna double helix there's another enzyme that is happening simultaneously it's, it's doing its job simultaneously this is an enzyme called 
Topo isomerase. That's a long one. It's the, the green little circle here, and it's really hard to tell what's happening here. What topo isomerase is doing is it's, it's helping to relieve tension in this helix as it unwinds. So this is this can be very difficult to, to visualize, but here's, here's my shot at it. So you could think of the DNA double helix as, you know, two long strings or rubber bands that have been wrapped around one another forming this double helix. Now as DNA helicase unwinds this double helix, sort of rips these two parts up, uh, these two strands apart from one another, if the other end is held fast, and it is held fast, that's going to cause the overall uh, structure to just so, sort of coil up like this. There's going to be tension in this structure if you start to unzip it like this. Uh, and this is this is not good, having this, this amount of tension. It's going to break apart. It's going to lose its structural integrity. So as DNA helicase is sort of unzipping these two rubber bands, what the enzyme topoisomerase is going to do, again, big complicated protein I've drawn as a green circle, um, is going to cut the DNA and then let it sort of uncoil, unwind a little bit, relieve that tension, and then seal it back together again. So that we have, you know, nice straight DNA double helix after this unzipping has happened to prevent this from getting out of control, this sort of coiling up. If this is difficult to wrap your brain around, that's fine. Again, this is very difficult to visualize. The only thing you need to know about topoisomerase is that it relieves tension in the DNA double helix. I'm not get, you know even, I'm not even calling it number two in this process. I'm sort of lumping it with DNA helicase because it's doing it's doing this as helicase is doing its thing. Topoisomerase relieves tension in the DNA helix. That's all you really need to know about topoisomerase. Okay, now we have single-stranded DNA that is you know not tensioned up uh, after the site of unwinding ready to start building DNA complementary to this, right? Well, not quite. Single-stranded DNA, as it turns out, is not very stable. DNA doesn't like to be single-stranded, and it wants to find partners. It, it wants to zip right back up again. So as helicase unzips the DNA, we have our next protein coming in here, proteins called single-strand binding proteins. Um, get little purple things right here. Again, it's kind of hard to see what they're doing. Here is a better figure showing these things. Yep, we got the DNA double helix. There's helicase here. And yes, these are the single strand or single stranded binding proteins. Uh, they, they do exactly what their name implies. These are proteins that bind to single stranded DNA exactly like you see here. Um, and their, their purpose is to stabilize the single-stranded DNA and to prevent it from just zipping right back up again. So in summary, protein number two or you know step number two, again, you know I'm never going to ask a test question. What's step four? The numbers are just so we can walk through this uh, one piece at a time. Single-strand binding proteins bind single-stranded DNA and they prevent rewinding of this DNA double helix. Okay, now we're ready to start building DNA, right? Well, the, the enzyme that's going to build DNA is called DNA polymerase. Um, there are gonna be a couple of these, so there are Roman numerals associated here, but the, the enzyme that actually constructs DNA is called DNA polymerase. But we're not ready for it yet. There's a problem with DNA polymerase. If we have, you know, a fresh, you know, single-stranded DNA right here, ready to be replicated, ready to, you know, put in a nucleotide complementary to this nucleotide, and then a nucleotide complementary to this one, build a strand of DNA up here, DNA polymerase cannot get started. DNA polymerase, and, you know, Paul is a very common abbreviation for polymerase in figures and notes and stuff like that. DNA polymerase cannot start a new strand of DNA. It cannot plop down that first nucleotide if this is a if this is an a you know if you're going to start building there needs to be a t right here complementary to it dna paul just it can't it can't start so before we get to the action of dna polymerase we need something that can start dna polymerase it it can build off of something it just can't put down the first one 
So before we get to DNA, Paul, our next step is actually an enzyme called primase. Primase is an enzyme that builds a primer. Uh, we could see this here, yep, another, another figure, you know, there's the DNA double helix, and, you know, helicase is not pictured, topoisomerase is not pictured, single-strand binding proteins are not pictured. Again, trying to keep it simple, uh, we've unzipped it, and yes, here is the enzyme primase, and here's the enzyme primase. What primase does is it builds a short primer, <laughs> as the name implies, that is made of RNA. This is not what we want, ultimately. We don't want a DNA-RNA hybrid here. We're trying to replicate DNA. When we're finished, we want all of this to be DNA, and we want all of the other strand to be DNA. And we'll get there by the time we're done, but again, the reason we're doing this, the reason we're mucking around with RNA in the first place, is because of this limitation of the enzyme we actually want to use. DNA polymerase cannot get started, but primase can. It's going to make this short RNA primer complementary to the DNA. Again, you know, T in the DNA, A in the RNA, C in the DNA, G in the RNA, and, and so on. So primase creates a short RNA primer that is complementary to the DNA. Once this little primer is in place, now we can proceed, step number four, DNA polymerase, specifically DNA polymerase 3. So there's going to be another one we'll, we'll bring up, but the, the one that's going to do the, the biggest part of all this is called Paul 3. And we can see it here. Uh, yeah, it's extending this primer. Again, it couldn't get started, but once there's a, a few nucleotides for it to build off of, it's going to take it and just go to town building DNA, pairing A's with T's and C's with G's, uh, creating double-stranded DNA, building this strand complementary to this strand here. So DNA Paul 3 extends the RNA primer, uh, building DNA complementary to the single-stranded template. And yep, we can see it here. DNA Paul 3, again, this sort of yellowish-orange rectangle, but yeah, it's, it's constructing DNA. Uh, there's another protein associated with DNA polymerase, because this, this could be a pretty long job for DNA polymerase to build all this DNA. We want to make sure it doesn't quit before it's, you know, reached the end. Uh, so there is a protein called the sliding clamp that's associated with DNA Paul 3 As the word clamp implies, it's just going to hold it in place, slide along with it, make sure it doesn't fall off prematurely. So, again, I'm not giving this its own little number here. It's associated with DNA Paul 3. The sliding clamp protein holds it, meaning DNA Paul 3, in place. Okay. Now is the hard part. So, now is the reason why I introduced the 5 prime, 3 prime stuff at the end of the last recorded lecture. This DNA polymerase 3 enzyme can only build DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Remember, every strand of DNA has a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end. And this enzyme that's building DNA, that's doing the, the big important job of this entire process, can only build in a certain direction. If we go back to our figure showing DNA polymerase, we can see that, yeah, I, I've, I've labeled this. So uh, the way this you know, particular figure is drawn, it looks like the template up here is 3 prime on the left and 5 prime on the right. That means the DNA strand complementary to this template has to be the opposite of that. Remember, these two strands are anti-parallel. They run in opposite directions. So if this strand up here is 3 prime on the left, 5 prime on the right, the strand complementary to it has to be 5 prime on the left and 3 prime on the right. And you'll notice the arrows here, this DNA polymerase is building 5 prime to 3 prime. I suppose the 3 prime is not labeled here, but we know that if this end of this particular strand is 5 prime, the other end has to be 3 prime building 5 prime to 3 prime. 
Let's look at the other strand. Again, it's anti-parallel to the first original strand. It has five prime on the left, three prime on the right. That means whatever strand we build has to be the opposite. The, whatever strand we're building has to be three prime on the left and five prime on the right. Because this enzyme can only build five prime to three prime, we see it extending this RNA primer and building from the five prime end toward the three prime end. Again, sorry, the three prime isn't labeled here, but we know that if this end is five prime, the other end has got to be three prime. So again, a small little statement with a profound impact on this entire process. This enzyme is only capable of building in the five prime to three prime direction. Now, what you may have noticed here is that these two DNA Paul threes, they're both building five prime to three prime, but their arrows are pointing in opposite directions. Because the two templates are anti-parallel, the two strands that we are freshly building are also gonna be anti-parallel to one another. One is gonna to point to the right, one is gonna to point to the left. These two strands of DNA are replicated in opposite directions. So here's my summary of this. And again, some of these statements, if you just take the statement in a vacuum, it's like, what the heck? This is a very visual process. As you're studying all of this, I highly recommend, and this is true for every chapter in this quarter, but especially true for this, uh, that, that you have some sort of visual to go with these just statements about things. In fact, you could draw a lot of this yourself, uh, of just drawing a line for DNA, another line for DNA, always label the five prime, three prime, stuff like this. This is a great way to study, to try to redraw these figures that will really help you appreciate these just statements. So because the two strands of DNA are anti-parallel, as defined in at the end of the last recorded lecture, they are replicated mm -hmm. in opposite directions. This means we have two different directions of replication and we've got two different names for these directions. So this DNA polymerase is building, if we follow the arrow here, five prime to three prime toward the site of unwinding. Now DNA helicase uh, and topoisomerase, they're not shown here, uh, but we know that they're here. We know that this double helix is still being unzipped. It's still in the process of being unzipped. We're going to replicate this entire chromosome. We're not just going to stop when we get here. DNA polymerase is, uh, all these things are kind of going on simultaneously. So DNA helicase is going to continually unzip this. And this DNA polymerase uh, is you know, going to build towards it, towards that site of unwinding. This is really convenient because this DNA polymerase that's building towards the site of unzipping or towards the site of unwinding gets to just keep going. It's just going to keep building DNA following behind helicase, which is just going to keep unzipping, and it's going to make one big long piece of DNA that is synthesized continuously. So this strand up here, the one that's moving toward the site of unwinding, is called the leading strand and it builds DNA continuously because again it's just going to keep going there's going to be more unzipped as it makes its way down one big long piece of DNA in summary still talking about DNA Paul 3 there is a leading strand the leading strand is made 5 prime to 3 prime toward the site of unwinding and again it is synthesized continuously no breaks no starts and stops it's just going to keep going as heel case keeps going it's the other strand that's going to be a pain the other strand goes in the other direction again they're replicated uh, or they're synthesized they're created they're built in opposite directions to one another this other strand is going to be built five prime to three prime but it's towards the left in this figure it is away from Gila case, It is away from the site of unwinding. So we know what's going to happen as we build DNA. It's going to build DNA, A's to T's, C's to G's, build, 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 build. And then it's going to stop. It's going to reach the end of 
the chromosome. So what, 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 what could we possibly do? Well, uh, once it stops, it's going to have to start again. So this strand, I'll get to that in a second, this, this strand that goes away from the site of unwinding is called the lagging strand. So the lagging strand of DNA is built 5' prime to 3' prime away from, again, I'm underlining these important phrases, away from the site of unwinding. It starts as close to the site of unwinding as possible. Again, we see this here. It started as, as close to it can as where helicasis is unzipping things. It starts as close to that site of unwinding as possible, and then it's going to end when it hits the end of DNA or when it hits the previous fragment. Wait a second. Fragment? Well, okay, let's, let's look at this. So this lagging strand is going to have to be constantly starting and stopping. Let's turn back to this big figure. And, and again, this was too complicated and too busy when we first started today, but we recognize most of this stuff by now. There's helicase, there's topoisomerase, our single strand binding proteins. Uh, yep, there's primase building an RNA primer. It looks like the way this figure has been drawn, the leading strand is on the bottom and the lagging strand is on top. Uh, again, which one is on top and which one is on the bottom just depends on how you draw your original DNA double helix. Whether you draw it three prime to five prime, five prime to three prime, or whether you put the five prime to three prime on top and the three prime to five prime on bottom. Leading strand, lagging strand, one is not always on top and on bottom. Which one is leading is the one that goes five prime to three prime toward the side of unwinding, uh, and the lagging is the one that goes five to three away from the side of unwinding. So yeah, it's a little flip-flop from this, but it's nice to see different figures showing this in different ways. It doesn't always have to be like this. So yeah, here's our leading strand. DNA Paul 3, it's sliding clamp, moving towards the side of unwinding. As helicase continues to unzip, it's just going to experience continuous DNA replication. What about that lagging strand? Well, here is DNA, here's a, you know, a primer, and here is the DNA that has you know, ended when it hit the, the end of the chromosome. Uh, here is a fresh primer, and it looks like DNA polymerase 3 built and then stopped because it ran into the previous fragment. Here's another primer, and there's DNA polymerase 3 building 5' prime to 3', prime, and it's going to stop when it hits this fragment. And here's another primer being made by primase. Again, as close to the site of unwinding as possible. You know what's going to happen, even though it's not pictured here. Primase is going to build this primer. Then DNA polymerase 3 is going to extend this primer. And it's going to stop when it hits the previous fragment. So this entire lagging strand is starting and stopping, starting and stopping, starting and stopping, starting and stopping. This whole process in the lagging strand is called discontinuous DNA replication, as opposed to continuous, which is how we describe the leading strand. This is also going to result in a bunch of these individual fragments where we started and stopped, started and stopped, started and stopped, started and stopped. These things are named after the Japanese... Um, actually research team, I think it was a husband and wife team, not just one person, but they had the same last name, uh, Okazaki fragments, named after the Okazakis, these little fragments, each one has its own primer, uh, and then some DNA, primer, then some DNA, primer, then some DNA, primer, then some DNA. So, let's summarize this, um, in the lagging strand, new fragments are going to start as DNA unwinds more. Uh, this results in many short fragments of DNA. Each one has its own RNA primer. That's going to be a problem. We'll deal with it soon. These fragments are called Okazaki fragments. Because this overall process is starting and stopping, starting and stopping, starting and stopping, uh, we say that the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously. Um, so, again, the lagging strand is the one that's difficult to, to understand. The leading strand is, in some ways, pretty pretty easy, just going towards the side of unwinding, if I may go back to this simplified thing. Uh, but, yeah, the lagging strand is going to start and end, and then as this unzips more, it'll start again and end, then it'll start again and end. You're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of these Okazaki fragments. Um, in the lagging strand, importantly, there are no Okazaki fragments in the leading 
strand. It's synthesized continuously. It's going to be one big long piece of DNA. These little fragments are only present in the lagging strand. And we need to deal with them. So every one of these fragments has a piece of RNA, an RNA primer here. We don't want that. We don't want any of this RNA. We have, to, we have to get rid of it. We needed the RNA as a way for DNA polymerase to get started. There is a reason why we needed this. But once we've gotten things going, once we've built a bunch of DNA, our next order of business is try to clean things up and get rid of these. So the RNA primers that we have constructed, especially the ones present on every single Okazaki fragment, need to be replaced with DNA. To do this, we are going to bring in an enzyme called DNA polymerase 1. It's all Roman numerals by convention. If you're curious, there is a DNA polymerase 2. It's um, beyond the scope of an intro course. So in, in, our, in our intro biology, we're only going to talk about Paul 1 and Paul 3. Paul 3 um, was responsible for building all this DNA, all this DNA. Paul 1 is just going to replace RNA with DNA. So let's take a look at this. We have Paul 1 labeled here and we can kind of see what it's doing. <clears throat> Paul 1 is coming in and removing the RNA primer here and replacing it with DNA. And you might wonder, why didn't we do this in the first place? Why didn't we just replace it with DNA? Well, DNA Paul 1, just like DNA Paul 3, cannot get started. It builds DNA, but it can't put down the first DNA nucleotide. It needs something to build off of. Well, in this case, what it's building off of is the next fragment. So yeah, all these Okazaki fragments are you know next to one another. So we're able to remove this RNA by building off of the, fra the next fragment. And you know it's gonna come over here uh, later and it's gonna remove this RNA and it's gonna build off of the DNA from this fragment. And when it removes this RNA primer, hey, the DNA hasn't even been built yet, but by the time DNA polymerase three comes in and builds this DNA, DNA polymerase one is gonna be able to remove this orange primer by extending the DNA from the previous fragment. So DNA Paul 1 does these two things. It removes RNA primers, very important, get rid of that RNA, and it uses DNA from the next fragment in line to build off of to fill in that gap with DNA. So by the time we're done, all this RNA, uh, you know, all these, all these primers, they will have been removed. We needed them only temporarily to get things started, but we're gonna you know, remove the primer, fill it with DNA. Remove the primer, fill in it with DNA. Remove the primer, fill in it with DNA. By the time we're done, there shouldn't be any of the RNA in the middle of this fragment. There is one last little problem here, uh, and that is when RNA prime, when, um, I'm sorry, when DNA polymerase one removes this primer and fills it in with DNA, there is going to be a tiny little gap. All the nucleotides are going to be there. DNA polymerase 1 will have you know, paired all the A's with T's and C's with G's. All the nucleotides are there. There's just one teeny tiny missing phosphodiester bond between the nucleotides. So we've done our DNA Paul 1. We filled in this gap. There's now double-stranded DNA where the RNA primer was but there is a missing phosphodiester bond between these two fragments. This was one fragment, this was the other fragment. They're next to one another. All the nucleotides are there, one little missing gap. The enzyme that is going to seal that gap together, and again, it's hard to see what it's doing, but really it's just coming in here and filling in this gap, is something called ligase or DNA ligase. And again, tiny little blue circle, tiny little job, but it's an important one filling in this missing gap. So DNA ligase seals together the now all DNA Okazaki fragments. All the RNA has been replaced with DNA. All these Okazaki fragments are now completely DNA and ligase is gonna seal them all together. So this means even though the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously, even though the lagging strand is start and stop 
and start and stop and start and stop and start and stop and it has all these individual fragments every single one has its own rna primer because of the work of dna paul one and dna ligase by the time we are finished the lagging strand is going to be one big long piece of dna it's going to look just like this nice neat leading strand uh, there so yeah they're, they're the end result is going to be the same but the process is going to be different the leading strand is built in one go uh, toward the site of unwinding you see a little arrow here toward the site of unwinding the lagging strand is going to be built discontinuously starting and stopping starting and stopping starting and stopping but by the time we're done it's going to be one big long piece of dna so yeah that's the action dna ligase sealing together these now all dna okazaki fragments now there is a, a table here <laughs> from the textbook uh, that looks like a bunch of information to memorize but if i can be honest with you we we talked about all this already so th I, I like this table because it's kind of just a summary of everything we've talked about so far so yeah you could you could print this out you could write this up you could study this whatever this is no new information this is just a single table that shows kind of a summary of all the enzymes we have talked about so far uh enzymes and proteins um it is worth noting a couple of things i don't know if i've mentioned this before almost all enzymes in biology end with ace so if it's catalyzing a chemical reaction like you know connecting uh you know making phosphodiester bonds like ligase or creating rna like primase or breaking hydrogen bonds like helicase or you know polymerase building dna uh yeah if, if, it, if it ends in ace you know that it's an enzyme it's making a chemical reaction happen um the and yeah so the sliding clamp is just holding things in place it's not catalyzing a chemical reaction the single strand binding proteins are just stabilizing dna they're just binding to dna they're not making a chemical reaction happen but yeah and, and this will continue on in later chapters you know it's an enzyme if it ends in ace anyway the one other thing i want to point out here is uh, just a, a simple way to remember the difference between paul one and paul three uh my kind of dumb way of remembering which one is which is uh three is a bigger number than one <laughs> and three is doing a bigger job than paul one dna paul three does all of the leading strand it does all these the initial dna in the lagging strand big job here paul one just fills in these little gaps where the primer was paul one is just building you know these little pieces of dna to replace the rna primers here so uh three is a bigger number oh, i'm sorry i skipped to the wrong table here uh three is a bigger number than one three is doing a bigger dna replication job than dna polymerase one just my little way of remembering the difference as promised let us now talk about the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes again everything we talked about just now with dna replication applied to, to to both of these things but how is dna replication different between these two types of cells well again fundamentally it's the same so the eukaryotic replication is fundamentally the same as prokaryotes is uh except for Oh, the following. Okay, this, this is a big table. These are differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Lucky for us, I don't, don't want to cover every single one of these differences. I just want to co cover uh, a small number of these. Um, so you just need to know what I've written down in these slides. Uh, just know, you know, there are a bunch of differences. I'm highlighting a couple of the big ones. So it's the same, but eukaryotic replication is slower. And that should make sense the eukaryotic chromosome is uh more complicated it's got histone proteins and chromatin it just takes a longer time to go through the process of replication in a eukaryotic chromosome it's slower it's also a lot bigger you know the prokaryotic chromosome the sort of closed circle is a lot smaller than the eukaryotic chromosome which is this big long line so if we want to 
finish replication in a timely manner, we're not just going to have a single replication fork. If we're replicating a eukaryotic chromosome, we're going to have a bunch of replication forks. We're going to have multiple, what are called origins of replication, all along this big long chromosome. So here's a replication fork with leading strand, lagging strand. Here's a replication fork. Here's a replication fork. Here's one, here's one, here's one, and, and usually even more. So yeah, eukaryotes are gonna have multiple origins of replication along their chromosomes, which again, makes sense, they're bigger. The other difference has to do with that fact that, that, uh, that it's linear. So prokaryotic chromosomes are circles and eukaryotic chromosomes are, are lines, are sausages. So there's an issue here with the primers and the ends of these chromosomes. So this is a, a uniquely eukaryote problem. The five prime ends of our linear chromosomes cannot replace the RNA primer with DNA. Remember that replacing the RNA primer with DNA was the job of, of DNA polymerase one. And I told you that it you know, removed the RNA primer and it fills in this gap using the next fragment's DNA. But what if there is no next fragment? What about the very first primer here on the leading strand, the very edge of the chromosome, and what about the very last primer here on the lagging strand? How are we gonna replace those? Let's think about this and look closely at the labels here. There was an RNA primer here, you could remove it, but how are you gonna fill this in? We can't build DNA from three prime to five prime, so we can't like build from right to left to fill in this gap. And we can't extend a previous fragment because there is no previous fragment. It's just, you can't do anything here. The same thing is true over here. If you wanted to build five prime to three prime, you would need something to build off of. And there is nothing to build off of. This is the end of the line. And we can't go three prime to five, five prime to fill this in. So there's, there's nothing we can do. And again, prokaryotes don't have this problem. It's a big old circle. Everything's connected to everything else. You could always fill in every single RNA primer. You could always fill in everything because it's all connected to itself. So th this is a, a good visual of what I mean when I say that we cannot replace the RNA primer with DNA at the five prime ends. So these ends here, uh, we, we just, we can't replicate this little piece of DNA here. There was a primer, it's removed, but we can't fill it in with DNA. So what, what, what does that mean for our chromosomes? How do, how do we replicate this? Well, the answer is we don't, we can't. Uh, this little portion of DNA at both ends of the chromosomes ends up not getting replicated. We're gonna lose this information. Our chromosomes are going to get a little bit shorter every time we go through the process of DNA replication because we can't replicate these ends. In summary, yeah, nothing to build off of. DNA polymerase definitely cannot build five prime to three prime. So this problem leads to shortening of chromosomes, which is, in all caps, BAD. <laughs> DNA is really important. It is the instructions for how our cell is supposed to do everything. Even if it's just, you know, a handful of nucleotides on, on each end, losing any information. It's like, you know, taking the blueprint for a very important building and just snipping off little corners of it. And you snip the corner a little bit more and you snip the edge a little bit more. Eventually, it's going to have some catastrophic consequences on the important stuff uh, in that blueprint. So yeah, losing, losing DNA, shortening of chromosomes is really bad. And again, this is a problem that only happens in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes don't have this problem. So how do we solve this? There has to be a solution to this. We can't just lose information every time we do DNA replication. Well, there is a solution to this. And it's kind of tricky, but it's also kind of clever. So the solution to this problem is to use an enzyme called telomerase to build structures called 
telomeres. So telomeres are defined in the key terms. Sorry, I'm shuffling through my paper. Um, oh, telomeres are not in the key terms. I'm sorry, I have them here. Telomeres are a large region of repetitive DNA. They don't contain genes. They are built and maintained by telomerase. So if we want to visualize these telomeres, uh, yeah, there's the cell, nucleus, chromosomes, these little red caps here, the ends of the linear chromosomes, these are the telomeres. And if we were to zoom in on the DNA here, it would be repetitive sequences. GGGCAAA, GGGCCAAA, 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 just the same sequence over and over and over and over again. Uh, exactly what the sequence is, you don't need to memorize, and it varies depending on species to species, but the, the term repetitive is important here. It's the same thing repeated over and over and over again. These telomere regions do not contain any genes, the GGG, CCC, AAA, whatever. These repeats are, are not important information, they're not the instructions for anything. These telomere structures are built and maintained by enzymes called telomerase. Again, if it ends in ACE, it's an enzyme, so don't get these two things mixed up. Telomere is the name of the structure, the region. Telomerase is the name of the enzyme that builds these things. So how, how does telomerase build you know, a region of repetitive DNA? Well, let's take a look at this enzyme again. Again, big, complicated, cool enzyme reduced to, you know, sort of a tan oval here. But anyway, telomerase is a protein. It is an enzyme, but you can see there's a sequence of RNA. Oh, you know it's RNA because there's uracils. Uh, there's a sequence of RNA that is part of this DNA enzyme. So it, what it does is it binds to these repeats, and look at that, G's to C's, A's to T's, A's to U's, G's to C's. It binds to the overhang here on the telomere, and t telomerase has DNA replication functionality. As an enzyme, it is able to build DNA. What it does is it builds DNA complementary to its own RNA template. So half of its RNA template is binding to the overhang, the other half of its built-in RNA template is telling it to build a, a G across from this C, a T across from this A, a T across from this A, an A across from this U, a G across from this C. It builds DNA. Now, it only built a small amount of DNA, but it's gonna slide over. Again, overhang is complementary to its template, and then it's going to do it again, build more DNA. And then, not picture, it will slide over again and, you know, add on some more nucleotides, add more DNA. And you'll notice it's repeating the same sequence over and over and over again. That's how we get the telomeres. It's, you know, according to whatever this RNA template in the telomerase is. Now we can see primase coming in, building an RNA primer. DNA polymerase, building DNA complementary to all of these repeats, and we're building fresh DNA. What about this overhang here? Well, here's the interesting thing about telomerase and telomeres. We still lose DNA every time we replicate. This overhang right here, this G, 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 T, T, A, A, G, whatever, there's no way to replicate this. There's, there's no way to copy this over. You can see polymerase uh, right here, building DNA. There's no way to fill in this gap. We are going to lose this information. This is going to be shortened. There's no way to replicate this. Like I said, back here, we're going to lose the ends of our chromosomes. But we haven't lost anything important. All we've lost is you know one of these repeats as long as telomerase keeps coming in and adding more repeats to the ends of our chromosomes, the fact that we lose a little bit when we do DNA replication doesn't really matter. The DNA that we're losing is never going to be important genetic blueprint information. It's only ever going to be pointless repeats that don't code for anything that you could just build more of using the telomerase enzyme. I told you this was kind of a weird solution uh, to this problem.
But here's my way to describe this. So um, again, telomeres built and maintained by telomerase. It has a built-in piece of RNA, which it uses as a template to build DNA repeats. Again, construct some DNA, construct some DNA, construct some DNA. The important phrase here is that there's gonna be no net loss. Because of the continued function of telomerase building these telomeres, the chromosome ends will shorten every time there's a DNA replication, but they are rebuilt by telomerase. So we're gonna end up having no net loss. So, yep, again, this is unique to eukaryotes. Prokaryotes don't have to deal with this, but yes, we lose some DNA every time we do DNA replication, but because of telomerase, there's not gonna be a net loss in this process. Oh, okay, that finally takes us to the end of DNA replication and, you know, the telomerase, which kind of has to do with, with DNA replication. And again, I apologize for the accidental yellow here. Uh, telomere is not in the key terms, just to be perfectly clear. It's defined right here. Large region, doesn't contain genes, built and maintained by telomerase. Sorry, that should not be yellow. This brings us to the end of DNA replication. We are not finished with the chapter on DNA structure and function, but this is where I have to cut things off for this particular recorded lecture. This is also the cutoff for exam number three. So part of this chapter um, about DNA replication and the, you know, the background about nucleotide structure, part of this chapter is going to be part of exam number three, but the stuff we haven't covered yet, where I'll pick up in the next recorded lecture, uh, the other part of this chapter is gonna be on exam number four. So the, the exam three cutoff is right here at the end of this recorded lecture. We'll pick up this chapter with a slightly different topic in the next one.